Welcome to Financial Plan and Explained. I'm your host, Mike Menninger, Certified Financial Planner, owner and founder of Menninger & Associates Financial Planning. And joining me is Ryan Keefe, also a Certified Financial Planner and one of the associates of Menninger & Associates. Ryan, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, so what we're gonna do again is another case study. And the purpose of the case studies, um, we generally will take someone or a client or someone who came in it provides us with ideas uh, of what to talk about. But more notice, notably, what it does is we take um, some of their goals, some of their situations, lay it out on the table to be able to discuss some of the things that you have to think about that go above and beyond just what's on the surface and, and the solutions and the strategies and the ideas, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a lot of the reason why we bring the case studies into play because it gives us the ability to talk about and elaborate on specific things. So this happens to be one with which we both worked with. Uh, we did a comprehensive financial plan uh, with these folks and we spent a boatload of time uh, really digging down deep into um, their financial situation and their goals to try to help them get there. Remember again, that everything starts with the foundation of the six areas of financial planning, cash management, tax planning, uh, risk management, which is insurance planning, investment planning, retirement planning, and estate planning. And these are all integrated and they're also taken into consideration whenever we're doing a comprehensive financial plan. So Ryan, since you did the bulk of the work on this, mm -hmm. um, why don't you kind of start presenting the facts uh, for Pete and Donna. So it's Pete and Donna, okay. change the name to protect the innocent, right? Yeah, Is that yeah. from Dragnet? <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, start talking about what we what we ran into. Sure. So, uh, so Pete and Donna are a married couple. Uh, they're, uh, Pete is age 58, Donna is age 57. Um, I think it's an important thing to note here that Pete is a, uh, he's a do-it-yourselfer. Uh, he handles the investments on his own. Um, Donna, does it, or Donna doesn't really get too much into the finances, uh, but she's aware of things. Um, they, Pete earns roughly $200,000 a year, and then Donna earns about $267,000 a year. And that's um, total compensation between salary, bonuses, stock RSUs, options, yeah. stock options, you name it. Yep, correct. Um, so all in, if we're looking at their entire uh, portfolio, um, Pete and Donna have roughly $4 million in pre-tax IRA assets. They have about $150,000 in Roth IRA or after-tax assets. And then they have uh, $660,000 in non-qualified assets. So when we see that, we always talk about a variety of different things that People don't realize, they think they're doing the right thing. And by the way, they are. And, and I try to caution myself when saying, oh my goodness, you got yourself a problem here. But the reality of it is that people accumulated all of these IRA assets because they felt compelled to, to bang the 401k. Mm -hmm. Because that's what we were always taught. Hey, contribute to your retirement plan because you're in a higher income tax bracket when you're working than when you're retired, right. which usually was the case until more recently when things have flipped upside down. The other thing I look at is when somebody has these large IRAs, people don't want to pay taxes. And Go they're figure. like, well, I don't want to take the money out of my IRA. I have to pay taxes on it. And then what happens is it begins to snowball on itself. So. I'm not suggesting rates of return of 10%, but if you earn 10%, their $4 million IRAs grow to $4.4 million, and if they only take 100000 out, then that's $4.3 million. And if that grows by 10%, what ends up happening is, you know, the, the law of compounding interest, this thing takes off. And I refer to it as a runaway train, which... People don't want to take the money out. And, and next thing you know, this creates estate planning issues, problems with taking the money out when they have their required minimum distributions, because now 4% of a giant number results in 
a giant, giant number. number yeah. And all of a sudden, not only are they going to get whacked with higher tax rates, but then they're going to be impacting IRMA, which is yeah. effectively additional premiums that you have to pay on Medicare. So anyway, that's the first thing I noticed when I took a look at this and said, wow, we've got ourselves a situation here. And we try to convey that to the clients. Mm -hmm. I mean, I never want to belittle someone and say, you got $4 million in your IRA, but it's important for them to understand the hand that they dealt themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, I'll let you go. Okay. And one important distinction I should have made is that Donna has been working at the same company for over two decades. She still has a 401k with a rather large amount in it. Uh, whereas Pete, on the other hand, um, he just got a new job recently. So m majority of his pre-tax assets are in traditional IRAs. Which is going to come up mm -hmm. as an important topic that we run into a lot. A lot more you'd think. Okay, but we run into it a lot. All right, so let's go to the next page of facts. Yeah. So um, when Pete and Donna came in to see us, uh, both of them... They like what they do, but they're considering retiring this year. And part of that is because Pete understands um, the low tax rates that we find ourselves in right now, um, which we'll discuss later. Um, they have roughly a cost of living of about $7,000 a month. Um, and they have two daughters who are both financially independent, which will come into play with uh, certain estate planning uh, strategies that we have. So you take a look at this on the surface. And I see that their cost of living is $7,000 a month. They're taking home more than twice that, mm -hmm. which is good. Don't get me wrong. That's great. Yeah. That's why they have a lot of the money that they have is because they've been able to save all these years. Right. Okay. They're driving the maximum amount into their 401ks, et cetera, et cetera. But if you were to just take a look at, if their cost of living is $7,000 a month, Remember that runaway train that I was telling you about? If their cost of living is $7,000 a month, that's $84,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Fine. If you got $5 million earning 2%, that's $100,000 a year mm -hmm. and after tax. So they got $5 million and herein lies, if they're earning 10%, they're growing by 500,000, spending 100. This is a potential runaway train. Again, this sh shows it because their cost of living is relatively low. So when we see something like that from a financial planning perspective, we're less concerned about them being able to live comfortably for the rest of their lives. Correct. We're now considering how do we make it so that the federal government isn't one of the primary beneficiaries of their estate Correct. while they're alive and after they pass. All right? Correct. What else have we got? Their goals. So the main goal when Pete came in to see us was he wanted to take advantage of the historically low federal tax uh, rates that we find ourselves in right now, um, which he hasn't been able to do because him and his wife, they make too much. Um, so what he really wants to do is start um, converting IRA to Roth IRA um, and pay the taxes now. Um, this will help with a number of estate planning issues as well as you know, capturing lower uh, federal tax tax rates. Um, we also, since they're in their late 50s, um, we need to determine if they are going to retire this year, what are going to be their cash flow sources um, for the next few years until they can start collecting Social Security, which is at age 62. Um, as well as pulling from their retirement accounts at age 59 and a half, right. which is a topic of conversation that we're going to get to next. Um, they both have uh, they both have pensions at their in, at their uh, work, and they haven't decided whether they want to take the lump sum or take the annuity option. Um, this will really come into play with Donna as she has the larger uh, pension, um, but it'll come into play with both of them. And it's interesting that we find ourselves in a scenario where the Fed may be considering cutting interest rates because that'll play that is correct a, a key role in that, which we're going to talk about later. The, the lump sum some pretty remarkable uh, comparisons when you're understanding how lump sum uh, distributions work. Right. Um, and then, as I stated before, they have uh, two daughters, um, which 
as we all know from the, uh, the new SECURE Act, um, if, the, if something were to happen to both Pete and Donna with their $4 million in pre-tax IRA assets, that could pose a huge estate problem uh, for their daughters having to take out uh, you know, $2 million roughly each in a 10-year time span. Right. And uh, so sort of the rule of thumb is if you were to earn 7% on your money, then you'd have to take 15% out annually. And 15% of $2 million just with the IRA is $300,000 a year. And once again, one of the primary beneficiaries are three people that we don't like around here. Yes. Mr. I, Mr. R, and Mr. I. That is correct. Those are the three people we try to suppress where <laughs> possible, within legal limitations, of course. So this actually um, brings up something that I like to talk about are milestones. Milestones, time horizons, whatever the case may be. They generally start when people turn 50 because that's the first time with which the amount that they can contribute to their retirement plans, whether it be their 401k, their 403b, IRA, that's where catch-up provisions come into play. But in this case, with Pete and Donna who are 58 and 57, well, you know, 50 is, uh, that ship has sailed. So let's talk about some of the milestones that we've got going on here. Um, actually, you know what? This would be a good thing to pick up. Good time to take a break. We're going to pick up this timeline and the time horizons when we return from break. So uh, stay with us. We'll be back with you in just a few moments. Do you keep up regularly with your investments? Where exactly are your hard-earned dollars going? Are you financially prepared for an emergency? I'm Mike Manager, founder of Manager & Associates Financial Planning. We believe that education and knowledge are powerful, and we want our clients to understand why we are making the recommendations that we make. It's your money, and you deserve to know where it's going, because it's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. So call us today to discuss your financial concerns. Welcome back to Financial Plan and Explained. I'm your host, Mike Menninger, here with uh, Ryan Keefe. Uh, so where we left off is we gave some of the facts associated with uh, Pete and Donna with regards to their situation. And where I want to take pretty much the rest of this um, episode is the timeline and time horizons that we talked about right before going on break. Because this brings up a whole lot of different things that are worth discussing. Okay, so start off here. You can see we used age 58, all right? There's a couple key issues that are going on supposedly for the next year or two. Just so happens that from the time that we first met them, which by the way, I love this, you know, uh, we probably met them and what, maybe two months later, Donna, submitted for retirement, <laughs> you know, he so, loves it. and by the way, that makes us feel good because they weren't really sure if they could retire. And we demonstrated that you could retire very easily. However, we still wanted to go through all the different things. Now, again, we wholeheartedly believe that education and knowledge are powerful. And one of the things we like to do is, is, teach people so that we can guide them to making well-informed financial decisions. So what this first window does is it talks about things prior to age 59 and a half. 59 and a half is when people can begin pulling money from IRAs, 401ks, Roth IRAs with no penalty, all right? But a little known rule applies if you've attained the age of 55, all right, I'm a December birthday. Mm -hmm. If I attain the age of 55 hypothetically this year, and I terminate employment, and that's the term that's used in the IRS code. If I terminate employment with my current employer, I can access my 401k mm -hmm. without paying a 10% penalty. That's big. Okay. May not necessarily apply to Pete and Donna, mm -hmm. but we see this a lot, where they want to retire, but 
they feel like they can't because they have no access to money prior to age 59 and a half, right. or at least not enough. And so I've been able to say, look, you know, you can retire prior to age 59 and a half. And it's not uncommon that a majority of people's net worth is tied up in the retirement plans. Correct. Yeah. And if they feel as though they can't retire until 59 and a half because they can't touch the retirement, it's not necessarily true. And it's a, it's a little known rule. Right. So they have access to their 401k. So they could retire, live on whatever, but if they need money, they grab it from the 401k. A little bit of a hassle. You got to pick up the phone, contact the 401k provider. Right. But the 401k is also required by law to withhold 20%. Yeah, 20% in federal taxes. Okay. The other thing that happens in their particular case is for the next two years, the tax laws. Right. right. So, because, yeah, because the current Tax Cuts and Jobs Act um, that was set into law by President Trump, those will sunset at the end of 2025. Right. So, what happens now, and there's you know, it's an election year and people are talking about, will they extend it? Well, maybe, maybe not. And the only thing I can tell you, we'll find out. However, I will say this much is it's written into law that at the end of 2025, the tax code reverts back to the prior code, which was from President Bush from 2001 to 2017, which the taxes are higher and the tax code is slightly different, but the taxes are a little bit higher. So the issue here is it's written into law. So in order to not have them expire, they actually have to have it go through Congress as a vote to say, we're changing it to not change it, mm -hmm. which clearly spurs the ability for both sides to have a horse trade. Right. Which it comes down to every time uh, there's discussion of change in taxes or any type of budgetary thing must go through Congress. There's always a horse trade as to what is going to tra change in the tax code. And, and I know you've been saying it, we've been saying it for years. We think these current tax laws are unsustainable. Right. We have growing national debt, not only from you know, wars and aid that we're providing, but COVID. I mean, we just, the government was spending a, a ton of money at that time. And our national debt is, I think it just surpassed seven trillion, something like that. How about 34. 34? Okay, yeah. A little, a little <laughs> 34 more. 34 trillion, right. A little more than yeah. seven. So the other thing, too, is that um, the government is spending six trillion dollars and its revenue is five trillion dollars and its revenues from taxes they got to make up that gap and to your point with the debt rising what's happening is that every year the amount of money that we have to spend to pay our debt is rising itself it's getting to the point where it's 11 percent of our um, revenue that is being brought in is being paid on the interest on our debt and in 2020 it was 6%. Yeah. So that's bad. So fact of the matter is, is that we're in the camp that the tax code has to, tax rates have to come up. Mm -hmm. So whether or not they continue to extend them, we have to assume for now that they're not. So that with Pete and Donna basically gives them two years to be able to take care of or utilize the lower tax rates. Then the other thing that happens during the course of the next two years, now this doesn't work anymore with Donna because she just retired, but Pete is still working. Mm -hmm. And when you're working, that means you have your 401k available Ex to you. Yeah, exactly. Which means that, you know, Pete could sit here and just plow 30 grand a year into either his Roth 401k or his traditional 401k, at which point what we're gonna do is be figuring out which is the better place to go. And it's pretty clear we know what the better place to go right. is for him. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about that in the second episode when we uh, talk more about the strategies, ideas, suggestions, and things that they could do to help accomplish their goals and objectives. So again, now 59 and a half, 
the cavalry shows up, if you will. Right, exactly. <laughs> they have access to their retirement assets, their IRAs, Roth IRAs, without the 10% penalty. That is correct, okay? And that comes big, particularly for them, as you recall, they're overweighted in traditional IRA assets. If they wanted to pull them for their cash flow, they could grab them at that time, Correct. okay? Mm -hmm. Then the next milestone that comes into play is age 62. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they'll, that's when they're first eligible to start collecting Social Security, um, albeit at a discount uh, from their full retirement age, but that's the first age that they're right. allowed to take it. Which we'll talk about in the next episode. There is all kinds of issues that are surrounded or surrounding Social Security planning. And we'll touch upon that in the solutions and ideas and strategies when we come to the next episode on this. Then age 63, what in the world is age 63? Well, age 63 is when you, ha that is the age when you have to start taking uh, IRMA into, a, into consideration. 63, but wait a minute, I thought IRMA was associated with Medicare. It is, and Medicare starts at age 65, but what they do is they look at your tax return from the prior. Two, two years, years earlier. Two years earlier. So in other words, when they're 63, we have to take into consideration their income that year mm -hmm. because we're going to be impacting their Medicare premiums. Their Medicare premiums in two years. And as I always pointed out, anytime that there is an exchange of money between you and the government and it's associated with your income, you can call it IRMA, you can call it whatever heck you want. There's a three letter term for that. Tax. It's a tax, <laughs> you know. So we have to take that into consideration when it comes to tax planning. Correct. And IRMA's income related monthly adjustment amount. Right. I should have clarified right. that. That's right. <laughs> That's the excess that you pay on Medicare premiums. And then come age 65 is? Is Medicare. Which the importance here is that Medicare premiums today are like 175 bucks. If your income is above certain thresholds, it goes up. So let's just leave it at 175 bucks. But then you usually want to get some type of supplemental type of insurance, Medicare, GAP, Medigap, supplemental, whatever. And I like to say rule of thumb, that's another 150 bucks a month. But between the two, it's about 300 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. Sure beats the daylights out of $1,000 a month of medical insurance. Oh, absolutely. All right, And you're getting roughly the same coverage for $300 a month versus $1,000 a month. So for many people, you know, Pete and Donna included, for many people, it has an impact on cash flow. I mean, think about it. You're saving $700 a month each. That's not a small number. No, not at all. So, and by the way, the other thing we always recommend, do not skimp on insurance. All right. Age 67. Well, oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so age 67, um, that is when uh, P and Donna reach their full retirement age for Social Security. Not just Pete and Donna, most people. Most basically people. Basically anybody born 1960 and later their full retirement is, is age 67. And there's a lot of importance that goes with that. Number one, that is the biggest importance for people who are retired. That is the point with which they can begin to collect Social Security and not only not be subject to penalty, but if they wanted to work, they could, and they're not restricted as to how much money they can make. Correct. And that's an issue that a lot of people have with regards to taking their Social Security at age 62. It's early. And if they want to work, it messes them all up. Mm -hmm. All right, and then the next time frame is age uh, 70. So it's age 70, that's when, uh, that's when their Social Security reaches its maximum dollar amount. Right, right. And sometimes it may make sense for one spouse to begin collecting Social Security at age 62 and the other spouse wait until age 70. Because what that does is that provides for the higher amount for the surviving spouse in the event that one of them dies. Correct. And it actually comes to play here. Right. <laughs> it does. Um, and, and lastly? Well, and right after age 70, which I didn't really have room to fit it on this slide, is actually age 70 and a half, which if you have uh, pre-tax retirement assets, you can begin qualified charitable distributions if you're charitably inclined which allows you to take distributions directly from your IRA and submit them to charity, um, and it leaves the IRA without you paying taxes on them. Correct, which is in effect like being tax deductible, but actually better because of the fact that is 
what often referred to as an above the line deduction. It's sort of a deduction against the income, which means it net net zero. So if I took ten thousand dollars out of my IRA and gave it to charity after seventy and a half, and we have to do it specifically directly from the charity. Okay, effectively, it's a ten thousand dollar distribution, and a ten thousand dollar deduction against that distribution shows up on your tax return as zero. And so, the, and the other added benefit of that is if you say have a fifteen thousand dollar required minimum distribution that year, and you send a ten thousand dollar qualified charitable distribution your required minimum distribution is effectively, effectively reduced to five. Right, exactly. And lastly? And lastly is 875 when uh, many people, but uh, Pete and Donna will have to start beginning uh, required minimum distributions from their traditional IRAs. So there have been rule changes. It was always 70 and a half. This was actually very confusing because then they moved it from 70 and a half to 72. By the way, it's such a moving target. I always forget when they do these things. I know. <laughs> they moved it from 70 and a half to 72. But the confusing part was they left the QCDs at age 70 and a half. Uh, yep. Okay. Not actually like, threw me off. Now that the government doesn't make things a little oh, confusing. Oh, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Then they moved it from 72 to 73. And then in 2033, it becomes age 75. So basically, anybody born 1958 or later will have RMDs. Actually, 1958 is weird because they're going to have to pay it in 74. So basically, anybody <laughs> born in 59 and later, their RMDs don't occur until they're uh, age 75. Right. Okay. I personally don't know why they did that. I, it, <laughs> it makes no sense. If you're trying to bring revenue in, you don't kick out the time that they're going to do RMDs. People are living longer, I guess, than they're in so, the age. Uh, I, I, don't uh, I don't know the brain <laughs> philosophy that went behind that, but it's the government, and we're here to help. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, we're going to wrap up for this half of the uh, episode on Pete and Donna for the sake of a case study. What we're going to do is come back for a second episode and we're going to go through some of the ideas, given what they have, some ideas that they could employ to help them accomplish their goals and objectives and also do things in a tax efficient manner. So thank you for joining us and we'll be back with you next, next episode. You have a wonderful day.